Good evening and welcome to One Faith. My name is Mark Masters. Tonight's show is going to be a little different than usual. Normally, we take a look at a specific topic. Tonight, are we, tonight we're going to be focused on, on an event. The event is the growing number of converts to the Catholic faith, specifically biblically well-educated Protestant leaders. Through their intense study of the Bible, they came to see the truth of the Catholic faith. One such person is Bob Sengenis, our guest tonight. Welcome, Mr. Sengenis. Thank you, Mark. Um, let's begin by you telling us about your conversion story. Okay. Well, uh, there's a book that just came out a couple of years ago called Surprised by Truth, and my conversion story is written in there. Which we have tonight. Right. <laughs> Surprised by the truth. And um, my story's a little different than most stories in there because I was born and raised a Catholic. Most of the people in there were Protestants and were born and raised that way, and then they became Catholic. Uh, at any rate, um, I went through Catholic grade school and high school, like you know most Catholic girls and boys do, and uh, you know was baptized, confirmed, and I knew all the things about being a Catholic. You know, we didn't eat meat on Friday, and we went to church every Sunday, and um, you know saw the bishop every once in a while, and you know there was just a lot of things going on. Our whole life was basically wrapped around our Catholic faith, and now that I sort of reminisce about it, uh, it was it was a nice time, you know, growing up in that. The only problem is, with a lot of Catholics, is uh, sometimes you, you either don't understand your faith or you don't put it in your heart where it's supposed to be and really grow on it, uh, you, and you take it for granted, you know, and that's what I did. Uh, when I was 19, um, I had a very intense spiritual experience in college, and what had happened was a friend of mine in college had talked about Jesus coming back and when he was going to come back he was going to get married again right. and I went back and I told a friend of mine about that and, and um, he says well if you're going to start talking about that kind of stuff then you want to prove it from the Bible and now as a Catholic you know you don't read the Bible too much <laughs> so that was kind of a shocker for me anyway so I got the Bible and I said okay I'll read the Bible I'll find out where he said that so as I started reading the Bible the Bible itself started to penetrate my heart and my mind like I've never had anything before in my life penetrated. And I was just really, really filled by the Lord. And I didn't know exactly what was happening to me, but I, did, I knew something was changing. And I read that Bible. It was a Good News for Modern Man Bible, one of the modern translations we have now. It's easy to read and even got pictures in it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, read that for six months. And I remember one night in college in January 1975, I read a verse of scripture. You might not want to say the year. Let me right. tell your age. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm not a woman. <laughs> um, I read that verse, and it was, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it upon you. My burden is light. And I just felt like Jesus was talking to me personally, right there in the room, you know. And I went to sleep with that verse on my mind, and woke up the next morning, and I knew I was a changed man. I just knew I was not the same man I went to sleep the night before. And then, uh, about oh, a week or so later, I started to go back to the Catholic Church again, because I had been away for a while, and everything in the Catholic Church made a lot of sense to me. This was when I was 19 years old. Now, I had been gone there for a good three, four months, and I really enjoyed it. And then I listened to a Protestant radio station, and they were telling me how bad the Catholic Church was, and not being knowledgeable in the Bible, or I'm not too knowledgeable about my own faith. You know, I, I listened to them, and was convinced of their arguments, and I knew that the Bible was correct, that if, 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 if your religion didn't measure up to the Bible, then there was something wrong. And this man made it sound like the Catholic Church wasn't measuring up. So I left the church when I was 19, and I started to join, well, I, I think the first church I went to was a Baptist church. And eventually, through a series of other churches that I went to, I became a, a Presbyterian, probably the most of my Protestant career, and I was in the Protestant churches for about 17 years. And um, you know, what happened with me coming back to Catholicism was after the 17-year trek, and, being a Protestant, I was an adult Sunday school teacher. I had a radio program out in California. I was answering Bible questions on the air. Um, I was writing books and pamphlets. Uh, I was uh, an elder in my church. I had gone through the whole gamut of what it is to be someone who knows what it is to be a Protestant. So I was very familiar with all that, and um, I studied the Bible incessantly. When I was, I was going to say that in your conversion story, um, you, you spend a lot of time studying the Bible, intense study. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, what I would do is uh, when I was in college and after college, I would get uh, jobs where I could work. Uh, I, this one job I remember distinctly went on for years. I worked from 11 to 7 at night as a hotel desk clerk at a hotel that didn't have much business. <laughs> <laughs> so all I did all night was study. And I did that for about seven years, you know, every day. I didn't even go out with girls. <laughs> <laughs> I just studied. And uh, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I made, you know, notes of everything that I did, and I memorized it and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I used that as a Protestant. But um, now that I'm a Catholic, I can use it that much more. But the, the reason I'm mentioning this about the Bible was the Bible was my life. I, actually, people called me Bible Bob, you know. <laughs> If there was ever a question somebody had about the Bible, they would come to me, and I could name chapter and verse right off the top of my head, you know. And it wasn't, I was bragging or anything, they just knew I could do it, you know, because I had studied it. So, at any rate, um, one, I, I, I had um, a friend of mine that called me up that I worked for at this Protestant radio station I was telling you I had this program. Right. Called me up one day, and uh, he thought he was calling somebody else, and that somebody else has the same first name as me, Bob. And so he's saying, hey, Bob, how you doing? I'm fine. How are you doing, Jerry? And we go on in our conversation, and finally he realizes he has the wrong Bob. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, I said, hey, Jerry, how you doing? You know, I haven't heard from you in a while. You know, what's going on? So he's talking to me about, you know, what's going on in his life. And I knew from other people that he had converted to Catholicism. And it was a shock to me, you know, th this family and his whole family had converted. So I was, you know, politely going to listen to him for about 10 minutes and then, you know, hang up. But I just figured he'd gone off the deep end somehow. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And, uh, but I didn't want to be rude to him, rude to him right. because he was my friend. So I listened to him, and so for the next hour, he's on the phone telling me about his Catholicism. And, and I'm going, mm, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> and then he comes to this uh, uh, subject about the communion of saints. And I said, yeah, and he continues to tell me about it. And I say, uh, well, well, tell me more. And, and so he told me more. And after the time, after he was done, I felt like there were all these saints in my living room watching me, talking, talking to this guy. You know, I just couldn't believe it. It was just a funny feeling that came over me. And then after, but after we hung up, I sort of dismissed it, you know, and went on my business. But they didn't give up. <laughs> the saints. <laughs> <laughs> the saints or my friends, okay. that's right. Yeah, the saints. <laughs> they probably were there. That's probably, yeah, now that I think about it, that's where this all came from. <laughs> Anyway, um, <clears throat> Bob, or uh, Jerry, finally did get a hold of the real Bob that he wanted to talk to, and this Bob also had converted to Catholicism, and we all used to work at the same radio station together. Now, these aren't men who took their Christianity lightly or, or were unlearned men. No, not at all. I know these are very, probably the two most sincere guys I know about their faith, and still are that way. Uh, so we're glad to have them in the Catholic Church. Uh, at any rate, um, so Jerry got a hold of Bob finally and said, hey, guess what? I was talking to Bob St. Genis, and it looks like you know, he's a little bit interested in Catholicism. And so Bob took the cue, and they brought over these whole box load of books, because I knew I liked to read. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and tapes, bo books and tapes. So I said, OK, you know, I'll read them. And I was just sort of going to casually glance through them. I wasn't really going to pay that much attention to them, because I, I really was, I knew growing up that I, I didn't want to go back to Catholicism. Right. You know, there was just something about it I didn't want to go back to, you know. And anyway, um, I started reading these books and listening to the tapes, and within three days, I was a Catholic again. <laughs> really? Oh. Three days. Wow. Yeah, I, because see, I knew, I knew all the problems and the questions, and, uh, and I, I just knew, being around it for so long, what to look for, you mm -hmm. know. And so I could penetrate these tapes and these books real fast, and I just knew that that, that was the answer. And one of the things that stuck out in my mind, among other things, was the uh, doctrine of sola scriptura. Now, that's the Protestant doctrine that only the Bible is our authority. And the question was posed to me, as it has been to a lot of other people, well, if the Bible is your only authority, where does the Bible say that it's the only authority? Right. Because if it's the only authority, it w that would be the only authority you could go to to get that information that it's the only authority, you see. So it's like, it's like a catch-22 for right. someone who says that the Bible is my only authority. But I had never been posed with that question. I mean, this was an earth-shattering question. Now, that's why I mentioned to you before about me studying the Bible. I had, the Bible was my life. It, it was absolutely everything that I ever did. And here somebody's telling me, well, how do you know that the Bible is your authority? You know? You're beginning, you question your beginning assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a you know, little child coming up to you. Well, how do you know this or that? You know, the other <laughs> thing, you know? I, 
And you, as adults, we just assume so much, you know, and we build our whole lives on what we assume. Like the story of the, the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> yeah, know, exactly. One of the kids comes up and says it. <laughs> and you're like, oh, maybe he doesn't. <laughs> Perfect example. Perfect. And, 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 and again, basically, a lot of Protestants are basically walking around with, with no spiritual clothes on because uh, they assume this thing about the Bible being the only authority, and they just can't prove that. You see? Right. And I knew instinctively that that was a key issue. You see, and that issue alone just got me over the hump. Well, maybe it had something to do with uh, the many different churches you went to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe it right, has a lot to do with it. As a matter <laughs> of fact, now that you mention that, I guess pushing me up the hill was all the different experiences I had in the Protestant churches, and then what got me over the hill was the Sola Scriptura. Well, thing. What was the first major um, denomination you went to? It was a Baptist denomination. Um, uh, that's not so important as what the problems were in each okay. of the denominations. You know, right. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> was it? Okay. We're well, way ahead. <laughs> Baptist, um, Presbyterian, uh, Church of Christ, uh, non-denominational. Went to a lot of those. Right. You know, uh, Bible-believing churches. You know, all those, and they all have one thing in common. They all say that the Bible is their authority. You know, and and that's attractive to someone who's looking for truth. You right. know, he figures, well, the Bible's the authority. That's your bedrock. The, yeah, that's your bedrock. And, and that's okay to a certain extent, but the problem is not the Bible, it's the people. <laughs> it's the interpretation. It's the interpretation of the Bible. Right. And every church has their different interpretation, you see? And there's no way to get away from that, you know? Um, and sometimes they say, well, we only believe in, you know, minor differences. There's only minor differences between us and the Baptists or us and the Presbyterians and all this stuff. Well, like, there's a major doctrine like baptism. You know, the Baptists say, well, baptism really doesn't do anything for you. And a lot of other churches say, well, yes, it's the means of grace. Well, that's a big difference, you see, because that is all about salvation. How do you get to heaven? Exactly. It's not a minor problem. <laughs> right. It's, yeah. not, it's not a minor question when you have problems. How do you get to heaven? There's A, B, C, D, E. <laughs> right. Uh, granted, there's some doctrines that are peripheral doctrines, but, you know, who to judge what is peripheral and what's not, you see? And uh, a lot of the doctrines that we ran into, half the churches that we had to leave were over this uh, issue of women's role in the church. A lot of the churches now want to make women the pastors, the bishops, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And we knew that instinctively, even from our own study of the Bible, that was just flat wrong. Uh, and, you know, fortunately, the Catholic Church doesn't allow that kind of stuff. So if there's any church that's being really biblical about that issue, it was the Catholic Church. But we found that actually the Catholic Church, as, as much as they're criticized for not sticking by the Bible, I found in my own personal study that it's probably the church that sticks as close to the Bible as possible. You get this area that we just talked about, like baptism, right. you know, or it says in John 3, 5, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And the Catholic Church, from the dawn of its history, has always seen that at face value. It says, well, we're, okay, the water might be symbolic, it might not be, but we're going to take it for what it says, and that's what all the early fathers had done. So they take the scripture at face value, and they don't fool around with it. They, they take it as it comes to them, and that's what I appreciated about them. Whereas a lot of other Protestant denominations would say, well, it doesn't make sense to us, so we can symbolize it or allegorize it or make it a metaphor or something like that, and they take away the whole beauty of what the scripture is all about. And there's many, many doctrines like that where I found out the Catholic Church was taking everything at face value. So if there's any church that did what I wanted it to do, it was the Catholic Church. Yeah, you see that problem a lot. Um um, I went to a, a Baptist high school, and, and you always heard that uh, um, the Baptists were like the literal, took the literal translation of the Bible, mm. and uh, the Catholics didn't. Mm -hmm. And, and um, how uh, uh, the more you study the Bible and, and the, the, the differences between Catholicism and, and uh, Protestantism, you see that the Catholic Church takes the literal uh, translation more often than not, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to the sacraments. Oh, yeah. Did you find that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Another one is the Eucharist, you know? I mean, they take for what Jesus said. You, Unless a man drinks my blood and eats my flesh, he shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, of course, for, for the regular man on the street, he can't understand, well, well, what is so special about this bread, you know? I mean, right. is, isn't it natural to think about this as just symbolic? And, and the answer would be yes. It is natural to think about it that way, you know? But, you see, God uses the foolish things of the world, something that we would consider mundane, and foolish and lowly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, he talks about that. And he uses those very things to bring us the gospel and salvation and his grace, you see. So what we may think is really foolish 
on the surface, God takes those very things to confound the wise, he says, you see. Because you have to believe in him by faith. You have to come to this and say, yes, even though my mind doesn't grasp this and understand it or it doesn't make sense to me, I'll accept you for what you say, you see. And that's what the Catholic Church has done incessantly since its history. It may not understand everything, and, but, it, but it takes everything at face value. And then you have other areas where uh, you may have a controversy between, and a lot of Protestant churches go through this, a controversy between predestination and free will. You know, you got a whole Calvinist camp that believes in predestination, right. a whole Arminian camp that believes in free will, and they battle back and forth, you know, condemning each other. And the Catholic Church has weaved those through throughout history to, to understand both of them together, you see. So even the more esoteric doctrines, the church has taken the scripture at face value and not sided with one or the other extreme. And that's what you find in Protestantism. You find uh, one denomination will get, like, say, five verses that they figure their favorite verses, <laughs> and they'll make a whole theology based on those five verses. And the other verses that may impinge on that or modify it some way, they sort of put those on the shelf, you see, or s try to explain them away or whatever. And that's, I did not find that in Catholicism. I found Catholicism took all the verses together and tried to make a, th a synthesis of it to, and understand what God was really trying to say by looking at the whole of the picture. And of course that's not by accident because no. um, the Catholic faith says that the apostles explained the Bible and through, the or through their oral teaching so mm -hmm. that you never have a contradiction between the oral teachings of the apostles and the written word of God. Right, exactly. And that's from day one. Yeah, and it's a good example that you just brought up because that verse I mentioned about John 3, 5, right. but you could look at that till you're blue in the face. It says, unless a man is born of water and the spirit. And you can never figure out whether John meant it to be symbolic or whether he meant it to be literal just by looking at the verse itself. There's no way, there's nothing there that to give you a clue. <coughs> there might be something that leads you here or there but you can never be sure. So the only way you can be sure is ask the person who wrote it. <laughs> right, right. What did you mean? You see, and that's why Catholic tradition is so important because we're claiming that yes, the person who wrote it told us what he meant and that's been passed down throughout the centuries. And throughout the Bible you see it over and over again where Paul says, hold to what we've taught you orally. Exactly. Don't lose what we taught you orally. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, that's right in the Bible. Right. So. Right. <laughs> so, so it wasn't, uh, going back to the conversion, uh -huh. it's not some, you know, like I walked into the Catholic Church and I saw the stained glass windows and I go, oh, this is so beautiful, I want to become a Catholic again. You know, I grappled with these issues, you know, the, the very core issues of theology and, and how we know things and history and all that stuff. And all the guys in this book did the same thing. You know, they really you know, grappled with the doctrines of, of either Protestantism or Catholicism. Okay. Well, speaking of the book, we have, um, uh, you, you're not the only one who's, who's converted. We have um, a list of many Catholic, uh, many converts to the Catholic faith who um, have been uh, uh, Bible-believing Christians or, or fundamentalists, and they've all written their stories here. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we can go over uh, like a timeline of what's happened through their, through their uh, conversions. And uh, I have a little list here. Uh, first moment is we call now what and that's um, once a person like you said you had a moment of conversion where you become born again a mystical experience with God where God comes into your heart and you feel like you you've become a Christian and then um, after that um, you have a period where you where you go you try to in, uh, increase your intellect in the faith mm -hmm. and, and uh, um, I imagine you had quite a quite a period of that also yeah where you, where you uh, studied the Bible and you went from different churches and mm -hmm. Um, um, pick different uh, uh, questions that you had, but it was it was an intellectual growth, right? That's what I'm driving at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, you know what I like about Catholicism so much is that it's it's the intellect and the heart that you can combine together. You right. See, because in order for me to assimilate all the intellectual knowledge that I have right now, I can defend Catholicism with my heart had to be there. Right. You see. And that's probably what I didn't have as much as I would like to have had when I was growing up as a child. I had moments of that as a child, but I guess I didn't have the uh, parental guidance that I would love, like to have had to lead me higher, mm -hmm. you see. And had a lot of other negative influences, and we all go through those in life. But my heart had to be changed, and that's what happened in that experience I told you about in college. 
and God worked directly through his word. And, and the funny thing about that whole incident was no one had talked to me about you know, coming close to God or receiving Jesus as my Savior, right. you know, all the nomenclature you hear today. Right. I picked up the Bible, I read the Bible, and the Bible did it. Okay. You know, and it just showed me how powerful God's word was. And that's why I wanted to study the Bible. I said, if, if this book can do this to me in my heart, and I know my heart's been changed, because I woke up that morning and I, and I looked around the room and I says, I'm not the same guy I was before I went to sleep. Right. If, if, the, if that book can do that, then I'm going to study this book. You see? Okay. So that, that's what moved me on. Okay. Well, uh, our next timeline <coughs> is not there. Now, not so much with you, but um, many of the, uh, the Catholic converts were uh, ardent anti-Catholic. <coughs> and um, uh, as they began to study different uh, um, uh, questions in the Bible, like we were talking about salvation, and, and uh, they found the strongest arguments from both sides, they began to see that the Catholic Church had a stronger argument than uh, many of the Protestants. But, I mean, that was like a terrifying experience <laughs> <laughs> because the last thing that they wanted to do was become Catholic. Yeah. But uh, the more they studied, the more they, they realized that, you know, the Catholic argument from a biblical basis only had stronger arguments than, than Protestantism. Right, right. I mean, there's all the guys in there, Tim Staples, he had a, some, one of his Marine buddies kept chasing him. <laughs> figure, well, Marines don't know the Bible that well, but every time he, he would confront this Marine, he'd get Bible answers that he'd just knock him off as such, you know? And uh, he tried to run away from, he went, even went to Jimmy Swagger Bible College, because it was the most anti-Catholic college in the United States <laughs> to get away from this guy who was giving him these good answers, you see? And what ended up happening, he actually converted to Catholicism while he was at Jimmy Swagger Bible College. <laughs> but here's a guy who's trying to run away, you know, and he's right, he running right smack into the wall. And a lot of the guys here uh, had the same feeling, you know. It's like, oh no, not Catholicism. Don't tell this thing that I've been criticizing all my life, you know, it's suddenly going to tell me that this is the truth. So it's a real shocker for a lot of them. And it was for me too. I was very anti-Catholic. For me to leave the church, there had to be something to draw me away. Right. So I was as vehement as these guys were. I hated the Catholic Church, desperately. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, from there, it's I need input. And that's the idea that um, once, you, once you reach uh, um, the idea that the Catholic Church might be right, then you just want to absorb as much uh, knowledge as possible about, about the Church and the arguments and the Bible and the different interpretations and what the Catholic Church says and, and what the Protestant denomination is. And you look over Sola Scriptura, salvation, um, uh, baptism, the sacraments, the Eucharist, <laughs> everything, and you just want to absorb it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Did you, I, I'm sure you had that same type. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just sort of just all came in at once. You know? <laughs> no, um, uh, I, I know that feeling, you know, where it's like you, you, you just, you, all of a sudden you found your true love or something, you know, right. and you just want to spend all your time with her. Well, that's what it's like coming to Catholicism. You mean, every second that you had, that you could spare. It was in the books, or was listening to the tapes, or talking to somebody, or visiting your priest, or whatever. And I'm happy to say it's still that way with me, you know, and, right. and, I, and I hope it remains that way. But it, it uh, you, you just have this yearning. Uh, and what it is, it's almost like a reprogramming, too. You know, it's like you've learned all this stuff from Protestantism, and it's a half truth. It's like there's some stuff that sounds good, and it's some stuff that's even true. But Catholicism gives you the whole truth. You see, and that's what's, it's like you're filling in all the gaps now from what you've learned before over the years. Okay. All right. Well, now we move from I need input to um, take up your cross. And the idea here is that um, uh, many of the people who, who were, uh, wrote chapters and surprised by the truth um, were uh, uh, Protestant leaders or, or they, they uh, were ministers in their church. And to um, come into the Catholic Church, they were going to have to um, lose their job lose their source of income, and uh, lose all their friends, maybe, in, in, in most cases, and just the sacrifices that a person had to make. So it was an, it was an intellectual faith that you were coming to, but also it was, it was, a, it was a cross that you had to bear. Yes, yes. Um, you know, and as I look back on that, because I went through the same thing that those guys go through, um, that was the key to their coming into the Catholic Church, you see, because God's going to test you. God's always going to test your faith to see if you really believe in Him and you really believe that He can do what He says He can do. Every person in the Bible went through that same thing. Abraham was a good example. 
you know, he's here. God oh, yeah. says, "I'm going to give you a son," and God and, and Abraham says, "Okay." And you know, 20 years goes by, 25 years goes by, and Abraham doesn't have a son, and 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 then God comes back and says, "I'm going to give you that son," and Abraham laughs in his face, you know, and God gets kind of upset with him, and then fi God finally gives him the son, you right. see, and and then he says, "No, I want you to take that son. I want you to go kill him," you know. And, and Abraham's trying to scratch his head here, you know, he says, <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of a God am I dealing with here? Well, see, what God's trying to do is he's trying to draw out that faith from Abraham that says implicitly, God knows what he's doing. And each of these guys went through that. You say, you, had to, you have to give up everything and put your trust in God and say, God, you know what you're doing. I know I'm going to lose my job. I might even lose my friends. I'm going to lose everything. And believe me, I lost all that too, you see. But he replaced it all. And not only did he replace it, but he replaced it tenfold. You see, but you, you have to make that step. Okay, well, speaking of a leap of faith, we have me a mystic. <laughs> and this is the idea that um, um, when you know that you're going to have to go make the sacrifice, and intellectually you realize that the Catholic Church is right, but right before you make that step, what's going to push you over the edge? And for most people in the book, it was the idea that um, they went to church, and, and they saw the Eucharist, and they saw the sacraments. And it was the idea that um, they actually were going to be able to um, receive the sacraments and, 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 and go to a mass. Mm. And, and it was going to be from intellectual faith to a mystical faith. Yes, uh, very true. I've known Protestants I've talked to, they say, well, if, if what you say about the Eucharist is true, I would be crawling on my belly up the aisle to receive it because you're receiving God, right. you know. And basically that's a good way to put it. It really is. That's, that's where the, the mystical part really comes in now, because now you have to take everything that you've been taught, and you have to apply it when you go to Mass. And you really see that little wafer, and you say, well, this is God, <laughs> you know? Uh, but for 2,000 years, we've said the same thing. And intellectually, I mean, anyone can read John 6, and, and, and it would, it's almost impossible to deny what, what Christ is talking about. Mm -hmm. So intellectually, you're there. But mystically, it's yes. like... It's like when, when you know that you're going to be receive it, that's something that you're, you're willing to take your cross up for. Right. Well, even intellectually, it's hard to get there, even reading John 6. I'd have to admit that. You right. know? But once you are there, like you say, then you have to take the next leap, and you have to apply what John 6 says and actually believe it in your heart. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, and you have to do that every week. You know? But this is the intimacy of God. I mean, God is a holy God that he doesn't allow sinners next to him. But he says, I want to be so intimate with you. I want to give you myself. And, and I want to give it to you in the most intimate way possible. I want to come into your body. I mean, how much more intimate can you be with your God? You know? Uh, so we have something that no other church in the world has, right. basically. So, and it's, that's, so it's an audacious claim, but that's the way it is. You know? <laughs> that's what our faith is. Okay, <laughs> and our last one is, I'm home. And this is the idea, the contentment that you have once, once you become a Catholic mm -hmm. and you receive the sacraments. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, in, in my profession, I'm an, a Catholic apologist. I go up against a lot of Protestants who uh, I know very well because I was in their camp at one point in time. Well, I don't want to brag for you, but I think you're one of the foremost Catholic apologists in the country oh. and one of the top debaters. Thank you very much. <laughs> appreciate that. At any rate, um, it's funny. When I go up against them, I, I, I can be very, very confident because even if my arguments aren't that great, I know I've got the truth. I just know I got the truth, and it's almost like I have to watch them try to squirm out of the, out of the little you hole. Can't lose. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, it's like God says, "Here, you already won." It's just a matter of you communicating it to them. You know, so that's my challenge basically when I confront them, wow. uh, and I really feel at home that way. You know, I really feel I got the truth because the arguments, if you really look at them closely, are unbeatable. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you very much for coming, and I, I hope for the people that are watching that this would be uh, this conversion story would be um, take it into their heart and to um, follow some of the things that Mr. Sugenis has talked about, and uh, maybe it would be the first step on becoming a Catholic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching.
welcome to One Faith. My name is Mark Masters, and tonight's show is on the papacy. Our guest tonight is Bob Syngenis, who is one of the country's foremost Catholic lay apologists. Mr. Syngenis is currently working on and bringing to publication two books. Bob, up update us on your books. Well, um, the first is called Not by Faith Alone, and that deals with the Catholic doctrine of justification or how we're saved. And that's about a 400-page book, and um, that'll be out probably in the end of January, okay. 1997. And then there's another book called uh, Is the Bible Our Only Authority? And that deals with the issue of authority and the Reformation doctrine of sola scriptura. Uh, Protestantism believes that only the Bible is our authority, so that's why the question of the title. And that's a uh, consortium of about 10 scholars from across the country each writing a chapter, and that should be out by the end of spring next year. And um, for, uh, for, for now, that's about it. Um, you also have a couple books here? Yeah. Uh, this is a book that just came out uh, called Jesus, Peter, and the Keys, and that deals with the papacy. And this is probably one of the best books that you'll be able to find on the papacy, and a lot of stuff that we talk about tonight was covered in this book. And I and a lot of other scholars contributed to this, and it just hot off the press, and ready to be sold. Okay. There and um, then, of course, this book's been around a couple years. Um, this is uh, called Surprise by Truth, uh, edited by my friend Patrick Madrid. And this is a collection of 11 stories of people who have converted to the Catholic faith from either Protestantism or some other faith. And um, my story's in there, too. And forward by Scott Hahn. And uh, excellent book. I read, your, I read your chapter. It's very good. Thank you. And uh, there's a 1-800 number they can call yeah, for more information on the book. Right. Um, unless they put it on the screen, it's 1-800-531-6393. Uh, they can order any of those books that I just talked about. Okay. And now to our topic tonight, the papacy. Um, who's the pope? What are the main attributes and titles of his office? Well, um, the pope is the what we call the vicar of Christ on earth. Uh, he's not the head of the church, as is commonly understood by some Catholics and some Protestants. Christ is the head of the church. Vicar is someone underneath the head who takes the place of the head as long as the head is not here. Okay. You see, sometime Jesus is going to come back and be the head. He is the head now in heaven, so it's just a matter of location. But a vicar is someone who works for the head. Um, and we have a succession of popes coming down who have an unbroken line since the first century. The bishops of Rome. Right. And um, uh, I mean, we can go into a lot more than that uh, later on, if you want. But basically, that's the way we would term the position of the Pope as the Vicar of Christ. OK. Uh, let's start to turn to the Bible now. Okay. Uh, one of the main passages the church uses to substantiate the claims uh, from the Bible is Matthew 16, 18, and 19. But when Jesus says this rock, doesn't he mean Peter's profession of faith rather than Peter himself? For in Matthew 16, 23, Jesus calls Peter Satan. Let's okay. go to uh, 16.23. Uh, so what he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And we'll compare this with Matthew 16, 18 and 19. Uh, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Uh, now, this is a good place to start, because um, let's just take the first part of this verse. Um, it says, and I also say to you that you are Peter. Now, this, is, this in the Greek is the word Petros. And there's a lot of confusion about that in Protestantism, because they say that because that is a masculine word in the Greek, because it has the OS ending, the Omicron Sigma ending, that it can't be matched up with rock, which is a feminine word, okay? It's Petra, okay. with the A ending. And we get that a lot in that different languages. Anything that ends in an A is usually feminine, okay? So they say that these two can't be matched up, rock and Peter. But in the Greek, uh, the, the, the uh, writer would have a problem because there is no way to give a masculine person a feminine name. You see, you can't call him Petra. So, and then there's no way that he can make rock masculine. He has to stick with Petra, the feminine form, okay? But in Aramaic, which was the original language that Jesus taught, it would be this. It would be 
And I also say to you that you are Kepha, and sometimes we say Cephas, right. Kepha, and upon this Kepha, I will build my church. It's the same exact word because in the Aramaic, there was no distinguishing between masculine and feminine, okay? So in the language Jesus spoke, there wouldn't have been a problem, but for the Greek writer who's translating what Jesus said, he has no choice. He had to pick a word. He has to pick Petros, masculine, and he has to have feminine. And for the argument that this rock is Peter's profession of faith rather than Peter himself. Yeah, well that, you know, the church does say it can be Peter's faith, but the problem with that for the Protestant is that when you look at all the early fathers, for example, they never distinguished Peter the person from Peter's confession of faith. They were one and the same. And, you know, Chrysostom, Augustine, all the great fathers never made that distinction. So you can claim that it's his faith, but it doesn't really get you out of the hole. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, uh, my third question would be along the lines of the Greek translation. Uh, the Greek translation for Peter is Petros, which means little stone. Isn't the Bible implying Peter's fallibility compared to Petra, which means large stone? For Ephesians uh, 2.20, um, says that only Jesus is the cornerstone. Right. We well, have uh, Ephesians 2.20. Yeah, Ephesians, so having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Um, well, the, the easiest way to answer that, let's go back to the previous verse. I'm going to stick, stick that up here okay. again, because we have to pivot off of this first. Um, the word rock there is Petra, and Protestant scholars like a century ago used to think that there was this big difference between Petros, Petra. Peter, and Petra. They've done a lot of studies in Greek etymology, a lot of archaeological discoveries, all kinds of things that have happened. I've heard preachers say that uh, Petros means little stone, so Christ was implying that Peter is a little stone that he could throw. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what they tell us. Uh, but most of your Protestant scholars now, anybody worth his salt, knows that's a fallacious argument because of all the information we found. Uh, as a matter of fact, Petra and Petros are interchangeable terms. Uh, Petra is used in context of, uh, like Romans 9, 33. It talks about um, the stone that the builders rejected and the rock of offense. Now that word rock there is the word Petra, and it's compared to a, a stone called a lithos in Greek, is the Greek word, you see. And the imagery that's there is that here's a man walking down the path and he stumbles over the stone and he falls. The, the a little pebble. Right, it's a little stone. The imagery is not like some big boulder coming down from the sky and crushing this guy, or some big boulder in his pathway that he sort of has to walk around. The imagery in Romans 9.33 is there's this little stone there and he stumbles over it, and then it's called a Petra of offense as well, you see. So right, right in the context of the New Testament, we have Petra being used as a little stone. And of okay. course, anyone who doubts that Christ said uh, Cephas in the Aramaic, as, a, as opposed to Petros, it's right in the Bible, which would be our next verse. Exactly. And these are all King James versions, so... Mm -hmm. um, we probably... Yeah, we'll talk oh, about I'm sorry. Too, <laughs> the one you want. Um, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas. Now, this is that same Aramaic word that I was just telling you about. See, when it's transliterated, sometimes we have a problem, but this is really, uh, in the Aramaic, Kepha, if right. they would give a hard K sound to it, and uh, see, and it says which is translated a stone. Now that in that's a translation of the Greek word Petros. Okay, so here we have Cephas ke Kepha being compared to Petros, being one and the same. So there really there is no problem, and I don't I don't understand why they haven't discovered this earlier, but it's just so plain that Kepha is being compared to Petros, and so there's really no argument in saying that Petra and Petros are different words. It, it almost seems like John went out of his way to um, invalidate that yes. argument. Yes, it does seem that, that way, yeah. It really does. Okay, well, let's move to our next question. Why would God change Simon's name to Rock when in the Old Testament only God is called Rock? Well, that's a common misunderstanding. Uh, granted, God is called Rock all over the Bible, and Jesus is called Rock, too. But to say that that's exclusive of God is just it's wrong. Uh, and I, Isaiah 51 uh, calls Abraham the rock. Right. You just happen to have that just verse. Just happen so. to have it. <laughs> I guess your answer. <laughs> uh, it says, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, 
and to Sarah, who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. So here we have Abraham being called the rock, you see. And it's significant, uh, there's a lot of connection between Abraham and Peter. Abraham is really starting the Jewish faith uh, through circumcision, and Peter's starting the Christian faith. You know, it's like there's just a lot of tie-ins there, and I can go into a lot of details that we don't have to go into now, but... Another might be that God changed Abram's name to Abraham. Exactly. Yeah. And we have a verse for that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. From Abram to Abraham. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall... But your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. And that's what Abraham means, father of many nations. So when we look to the Old Testament and we see coincidences with the New Testament, they're not really coincidences. No, not at all. They're put there for a reason. Yeah. For times like these. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I think we have one more verse here. First Peter. No, oh, no. That's Isaiah, uh, which leads us to our next question. Um, doesn't Revelation 3.7 imply only God has the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Uh, that's the verse that says um, uh, that, that I have the key of David. Jesus says, is I have the key of David. And he opens and no one can shut. He shuts and no one can open. Yes. Okay. Now, um, there's really no discrepancy there because Jesus also in Revelation 1.18 says he has the keys, plural, of hell and death. So we have this interchange between keys and key in Jesus' uh, usage of the term. Now, Matthew 16, 18 uses the word key, singular. Oh, I'm sorry, it's plural. He uses keys. I have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Right. Now, the passage that um, Jesus is quoting from in Revelation 3, 7 is this passage here, Isaiah 22, 22. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder, so he shall open and no one shall shut, and he shall shut and no one shall open. Now, the question is, that someone would ask is, well, if Jesus has the key, how can Peter have the keys? You see? And this is, you know, really, there's really no problem with this at all because there's a common motif throughout Old and New Testament that if the, the sovereign left his land, the regent or the vice regent would take over and he would have full control. And many parables that Jesus talks about say the same thing. You know, the landowner, he goes away on a long journey, and he leaves the, the, the land to his servant. And he's like the regent that takes care of things. And he has complete control over that land until the, the sovereign comes back, you see. That's the same thing with Jesus and Peter. Jesus is not relinquishing his authority. He's just sharing his authority. Now, you, you find this a lot in the terminology that the Bible uses. It calls Jesus an apostle. And it calls the apostles apostles. It calls Jesus a shepherd. And the apostles are called shepherds. Jesus is a rock and Peter is a rock. Then you have this complete interchange you see, and that goes back to the verse you were talking about before, Ephesians 2.20, right. where it says Jesus is called the cornerstone. So the question that comes up is, well, how can Peter be the rock if Jesus is the cornerstone? Yeah. You say, well, there's only one cornerstone in the building, and that's the one that they set first to determine the other sides of the building. Well, and that fits naturally with Jesus. But to say that there can't be other rocks inside that building that have just as much significance as Jesus in the sense of having authority while he's gone is just another fallacious argument. I heard a speaker once sum it up very well when he said, what God has, he gives. Mm -hmm. So if, if God is a rock, he'll, he'll give that title to other people. If, if only God can create life, then he gives that ability to a man and woman to create life. So there's no contradiction. What God has, he gives. Yeah. I think the, the part of the problem is that they think that because Peter is called a rock, that he's sort of subsuming, uh, or actually, yeah, he's subsuming Jesus under him. But that's just not the Catholic concept at all. I mean, as I said in the beginning of the program, Jesus is the head of the church. Peter is the vicar of Christ. And there's a big difference there. And, and that's where the confusion comes in, where people call Peter the head of the church, and he's not the head. Okay. Well, um, Isaiah 22, 22, uh, wasn't that pointing to a certain person, Eliakim? Yes. And uh, he was given the keys to the house of David? Right. Now, Eliakim... Um, you could compare Eliakim to a position that we have, like in the White House today, the chief of staff. Okay. See, he's not the president, but he is the, he's the guy that controls what goes on in the White House, and everybody looks to him for the questions and answers of the day. And the president sometimes is sort of oblivious to a lot of things. You know? <laughs> um, and you find there, there's a special Hebrew word that's used of Eliakim in Isaiah 22. It's El Habayeth, and, that's, and translated means the master of the palace. 
and you'll find the first mention of the master of the palace in 1 Kings 4.6. Uh, Ahishar is his name. And he is the master of the palace, or the El Habayith, to Solomon, okay. you see. Solomon is the king, but, uh, but Ahishar is his sort of right-hand man. He's the chief of staff. And you can follow this line all throughout the New Testament. Uh, there's another one, Eli, in uh, 1 Kings 18.3. He's, a, he's again called the master of the palace, the Al-Habayith. And you have Eliakim in this passage being called the same thing. He's the master of the palace. Now that leads us to Peter. Peter, see, he's the chief of staff. He's, he's the master of the palace now. What's the palace? The palace is the church. Because the president, or the head, is gone for a while, so the chief of staff is taken over, you see. And that's exactly the precedent that we had established in the Old Testament. So it's nothing new that Jesus would do that in the New Testament. I hear a lot of people talking about uh, coven covenantial theology, and that's mm -hmm. looking to the Old Testament to find uh, the proper interpretation of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what we're doing here, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it's, it fits perfectly in with Catholic theology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question six. Where in the Bible is the doctrine of infallibility taught for either Peter or the church? Actually, there's a verse, very simple verse, and, and it's the one we had before. Okay. Uh, and, and many people just skip right over this because they just miss the logic of it. But the way it's put, it's just so, has so much impact when you, lo when you look at the way he wrote it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you, that's Peter. Now, as a matter of fact, before I go on, this word you in the Greek is a singular word. See, in Greek they had singular and plural. In English we don't have that. Uh, but it's a singular word which can only refer to one person. Oh, I see what you're saying. Because you, in English, could be more than one person. Exactly. But it's not so. Right. Okay. In Greek, it's very clear. Uh, and so, and all these verbs here, uh, whatever you bind, that's that's a singular. You uh, bound uh, is another. Well, I'm sorry. Whatever you loose is another singular. So we all know that it's referring back to Peter, because that's the only proper noun that is the referent for those verbs. Uh, at any rate, the issue here is how do we prove infallibility by this verse? Well, let's look at it. It says, whatever you bind will be loosed in heaven. Well, who's in heaven? God's in heaven, and God's doing the binding, you see. Now, the question would be, can God bind anything that's a lie? No. No. I mean, th that's the natural answer anybody would come up with. As a matter of fact, the Bible's crystal clear on that. In Hebrews 6.16, it says, God can't lie. So God cannot bind anything that Peter says that's untrue, because ca heaven won't accept it, you see. And everybody in heaven's going to be affected by this. So God has to say, it has to be a true statement. In order for me to bind it, or for, in order for me to loose it, Peter has to say something true, or else I cannot validate it, I cannot confirm it, because I can't lie, God says, you see. Now, how is that going to happen? How is God going to make sure that Peter doesn't tell a lie when it comes to matters of faith and morals, or doctrines of salvation as the church is defined? Well, we have right in the context of Matthew 16, the precedent for this is established when Jesus asks, well, who do men say that I am? And the one that comes up with the answer is Peter. He says, well, you are the Messiah. Now, Jesus is astounded by this. And he says, well, this didn't come from you. It didn't come from flesh and blood. That is human beings. This came directly from the Father. That's how you know this information. So here we have the precedent that Peter gets a revelation from the Father about who Jesus is. See, so a lot of this talk about... And that, excuse me, that passage mm -hmm. was right before Matthew 16, 19, so it would be right in context. That's right. It's in verse 13, 14, and, and so on. And uh, so this issue that we were talking about before, about the, the, um, the rock being the faith of Peter, you see, that's not even the main issue in that context. The main issue is that Peter, not so much his faith, because all the apostles have faith. They all believe in Jesus. What is, what's the thing that distinguishes Peter from the rest of the apostles is the revelation that he gets from the Father about Jesus' identity, you see. And that gives us the precedent of how God is going to give the Pope, following Peter, the information that they need of the truth of salvation and every other thing, so that God, in turn, can bind the same truth that he gave Peter in heaven, you see. Okay. So very simply, the, what, Peter's infallible because God can't lie. And of course, we have more than one verse. Yes, we do. <laughs> Infallibility. Nope. Oh, we have Isaiah 22. Uh, hmm. uh, let's see. Ah, here we go. I found it eventually. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, infallibility comes right from that phrase there, right? 
Well, yeah, it's probably not as strong a verse, but it just shows the, the um, priority of Peter over the apostles. It says, but I, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, that means his faith was going to fail. <laughs> Strengthen your brethren. Now, this is a, talking about strength, this word in the Greek, sterizon, is a very strong word. Uh, and the brethren that he's talking about there can only be the apostles because that's the context of Luke 22. Okay? Now, in, in, in order for someone to strengthen the brethren that are the apostles, you have to have authority over them in order to strengthen them. And that's the connotation of this Greek word. In, uh, it's, it's a connotation of authority. It's not just like, I'm going to help you. It's you, you have position over these men. So when you return, this is your job. Okay, so that's more of a structural kind of a uh, thing, more than an infallibility issue in that verse. Okay, and also, I mean, Christ's Christ's prayer for Peter w would would have to be true, right? Because he was God. Right. So if he prayed for Peter's faith not to fail, then it wouldn't have to fail. Well, it could fail, but he could return. Right. Well, he's well, in the context already. of the verse, it says after you return. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, Let's see if we have anything else. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.15, or 1 Timothy 3.15. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it says here, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. And this is our key passage down at the bottom. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now this is an interesting passage because if you go up to a Protestant and you say, complete this sentence for me. The blank is the pillar and ground of the truth. They'll say the Bible. They'll say the Bible. And nine times out of ten, they'll say the Bible. <laughs> so then you just look to 1 Timothy 3.15, and he says, well, no, it doesn't say the Bible. It says the church is a pillar and ground of the truth. See, and, and you, the, we can read these verses many, many times, and it just goes right in one eye and out the other, so to speak, and we don't get the impact of it, but that's what it's saying. There is no other truth other than what is contained in the church. That is the pillar, and that's the basis. That's the foundation, you see. And who's in the church? Well, it's the Pope and the bishops, and that's all well defined by the Catholic Church too. But that's where it starts. So, um, what the what the Catholic Church is teaching is is that the Church was given the deposit of faith, and it's up to the Pope to protect the deposit of faith. Right, right. Now, that's the deposit of faith comes from the Apostolic Age with the Apostles. Okay. Uh, I think we have one more. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Um, this is just an admonition to uh, more or less pivoting off of the last verse that we had. How are you going to keep these things in the church? Well, the only way you can do it is to preserve it, number one, and you pass it on to reliable men who are going to do the same thing that you're doing. And um, as a matter of fact, the, um, there's another verse that comes after this that we don't have up here, but that sort of spells it out for us. But uh, Paul is telling Timothy, everything that I've told you, that you've heard me say in, my, in your ears, I want you to pass on to these men. You see, now we have a precedent for succession there, but we also have uh, Paul saying that the Holy Spirit will guide you in all this. And uh, it says, yeah, Keep so, by the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit that's keeping the truth. Right. That's, that's stopping the Pope from making a fallible statement on right. faith and morals. Exactly. So if we say um, tomorrow, can the Pope come out and say that um, abortion is okay? We would say, no, that's an impossibility because the Holy Spirit will not allow him to say that. Right. And it's, and it's in, a, in a, an official dogmatic statement. He will right. not allow him to say that, yes. Okay. So we have all the Catholics who can stand up and say, look, I'll put my, my faith to a test. If, if, the, if the Holy Father at any point contradicts the, um, the positive faith in any way, then we'll no longer be become Catholics. We'll change, we'll change our faith. Oh, I would make that statement in a heartbeat. But it won't happen because it's protected by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And if you have any doubt about that, we have 2,000 years of history to prove that the Holy Spirit is not allowed to Holy Father or the Church to contradict the deposit of faith. Right. As a matter of fact, I've often, in debates and seminars that I've done across the country, I've, I've challenged almost everyone I've been at, if someone can show me a doctrine that the Church has changed in 2,000 years, 
I will, I will become a Protestant. <laughs> On and, the spot. And, and it's amazing. And of all the places I've been, no one's ever come up to me and challenged me. Well, what about this doctrine? What about that doctrine? Nobody's done that. Okay. Um, how can the church teach a hierarchy in a, sacrifici in a sacrificial priesthood with the bishops and the pope when all Christians are part of the priesthood of all believers? Well, this is another misunderstanding. Um, there's this kind of unwritten rule that's implied from a statement like that, that there can't be a uh, hierarchical priesthood alongside of a lay priesthood, you know. But the scripture is very clear. I mean, even in the Old Testament, they had lay people who were priests. I mean, that's actually the way that God intended it to be for each of the fathers in the families to be their priests of the family, you see. And it wasn't until the people sinned that he took that privilege away from them and created the Levitical priesthood, you see. So that was sort of a secondary thing. <laughs> so the, the Catholic Church will never take away the priesthood of all believers because we still believe. Right. You and I are priests, you see. We're a holy people, a holy nation. All Christians so are. There's a priesthood of all believers, and then there's a sacrificial priesthood. Right, right. And one doesn't not necessarily contradict the other. Exactly. Okay. In the Old Testament, there was the Levites, and they also had a high priest, right? That's right. Which would be symbolic of our Pope. Sure. Okay. Um, where in the Bible is it taught Peter's office was transferable? Well, uh, let's start with Acts chapter 1. Okay. Uh, this is the... Um, I think I have this. Okay. Might be a few verses behind, but... a few verses behind. <laughs> you know, to bring the other ones back sometime. Uh, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. Now this is significant because Peter is quoting these passages from the Psalms. And the issue at stake here is, well, Judas has died and we have to have another one to replace him. Okay, so the, uh, the issue is having an apostle, the 12th apostle, uh, to be sustained. And Peter's quoting these Psalms. Now, if you look in these Psalms, do you see anything there about Judas? No. Do you see anything there about apostleship? No. No. Okay. So he, Peter's quoting these very obscure Psalms that any old Jew would have read in the Old Testament and had not the slightest idea what they're talking about. And yet Peter, in his role as the head of the church here, well, as, the, as sort of vicar, <laughs> as I say, um, he is taking these passages and he's interpreting them to be um, the precedent for establishing the office. See, because that's what the issue is here. It says, another take his office, all right? So in other words, the Psalms, long before the issue of Judas ever came up, had already established in the Old Testament that if someone left an office, that office had to be filled by someone else, whatever office it was, whether it was an apostle, a Levite, a king, whatever it was, you see. That, so it's nothing new that Peter's inventing. He's saying that this was already established in the Old Testament. I'm just extrapolating from the Old Testament and applying it to Judas, okay. who held an office of apostleship. Okay. See? Uh, our last question. Mm -hmm. Without an infallible guide, can any church ever know for certain if it is teaching the truth? Well, <laughs> you can answer that. <laughs> no, it's, um, you really, you can, you can come close. Uh, as I often use the example of Jesus and the woman who came to him with her, her um, sick uh, child, that Jesus said, you know, you can have the crumbs that fall off the table. Okay. And you can have some truth with that, but you're not going to have the whole truth. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, that's why we had to uh, skip a few verses. But mm -hmm. thank you very much for coming. Sure. And uh, thank you for watching One Faith. My name is Mark Masters, and tonight we'll be discussing the topic of Sola Scriptura. 
We are honored to have as our guest tonight one of the country's finest Catholic lay apologists, Robert Sengenis. Mr. Sengenis is currently working on a book on this very topic. Welcome, Mr. Sengenis. Thank you, Mark. Nice to be here. And tell us about your book. Well, uh, it's called, Is the Bible Our Only Authority? And we've uh, gathered 10 scholars from around the country, each writing a chapter on this topic. And it's due out probably in mid-1997. And I'm the editor, and I collected all the manuscripts, and I got a big job to do. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I'm going to give you 10 questions tonight. Okay. Uh, the first question is, um, is the Catholic Church a Bible-believing church? Well, of course. I mean, that uh, actually goes without saying. I, I guess that question would come up because people would say that the Catholic Church may go outside the Bible. You know, they would depend on tradition or uh, going to the Pope or something of that sort. So the question would come up, you know, is it a Bible-believing church? Um, but the answer to that would be uh, unqualified yes. Okay. Everything that the Catholic Church believes is either implicitly or explicitly in the Bible. Okay. Well, a lot of people think that the, the Catholic Church doesn't believe parts of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So, plus you don't see a lot of Catholics walking around Bibles to church. <laughs> <laughs> you can always tell a Catholic in church that he's not without the Bible. <laughs> All right, question two. Uh, what is the Protestant view of the Bible? The Protestant view of the Bible is that the Bible is the sole authority for the Christian life, which means that there may be other sources he can go to, like his pastor or, you know, reading a book, but they're not infallible. They can make mistakes. The scripture is the only infallible source of divine revelation, and that's where you get the Reformation slogan, sola scriptura. Right. Um, other people, though, it's, it's amazing the, the, the variety of views you have about sola scriptura in the Protestant world. Uh, the infallible nature of Scripture is one, but then there's others that have a much weaker view. They will say that, no, sola scriptura just means that uh, Scripture is sufficient to give us information about salvation. It doesn't have anything to do with infallibility, although the Scripture is infallible to that person. Right. They define sola scriptura a little differently, a little weaker than the other person, but that's basically what it refers to. The Scripture alone is the authority. So if they wanted to... Um uh, have a view of baptism, they would go to the Bible for that. Right. And they wouldn't accept any outside authority for baptism. Yeah, as to make a final decision on the nature of baptism, <clears throat> let's say if they had to decide whether they should baptize an infant or not. Right. Now, they may get help from other sources. Or, you know, what did this early church father say? Or what did Martin Luther say? But that they would not be the final criterion to okay. decide. And what's the Catholic view? Catholic view is that the Catholic view is based on what we call a tripartite authority. You have scripture, you have the church, and you have tradition. Tradition comes from the writings of the apostolic age and then what was transmitted down through the centuries after the apostles through the writings of the church fathers and the medieval theologians. And then you have the church, which is another authority, the church being the sort of the uh, the court of law, let's say, where if you have controversy between scripture and tradition or you have something that's not clear, then the church steps in and some more or less decides the matter. So they are also an authority. Not that they're over scripture, because scripture is inspired by God, right. but God also places a spirit within the church. So the church has the ability to judge uh, what is scripture, what is not scripture, what is tradition, what is not tradition, and the interpretation of scripture and tradition as well. So if um, holy tradition is the teachings, the oral teachings of the apostles, and uh, uh, the written word of God is the Bible, uh, the Catholic view is that those, they never contradict one another. Right. And one is not superior to the other, but they work in harmony. Right. Okay. And if there is an apparent contradiction, the church will step in and make okay. a decision one way or the other. So the church is like the um, Supreme Court. Right. You know, you have the Constitution, which is the written record, then you have legal precedent, in a court of law, they co sometimes conflict because the Constitution is not always clear. So you have to go to the highest authority, which is our Supreme Court, and that would be, in our parlance, the church okay. as the final authority. Okay. Uh, question four. Doesn't Jesus in Matthew 15, verse 3, contem condemn tradition? We got Matthew 15, 3 here. Well, the answer to that is yes. And no. <laughs> um, 
as you can see there, he is, he is opposing his teaching against what the Pharisees are holding up as a true teaching. And Jesus is what he's doing here is he's, is he's condemning bad tradition. He's not saying that all tradition is bad. There's many traditions that Jesus lived by himself in, in his lifetime. Uh, but what the Pharisees had a tendency to do was to distort not only the scriptures, but to distort their own heritage and make laws that were never intended by God to be. And that's bad tradition. We do the same thing in the New Testament. The Catholic Church sorts out good tradition from bad tradition. We're not saying that all tradition is good. That's why, the, again, the church has to step in to decide which traditions we're going to believe in. Okay. And it, it seems like Christ is saying in that verse that there's the traditions that they've made are, are contradicted to the commandments of God. Right. So that right. would be a, a, a man-made tradition. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and you, actually, you can replace the word teaching with tradition. There, there's really no difference. I mean, anything that opposes what God has revealed as truth is a bad tradition or a bad teaching. You know, that's all Jesus is saying there. Are there any verses that you'd like to go to to show that there's good tradition that's in the Bible? Sure, there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, we have... Uh, there's, I think there's one verse coming up here, 1 okay. Corinthians 15, 2. After some prompting, I got you. 11, 2, okay. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions as I have delivered them to you. And that's St. Paul speaking. Right. And uh, he had taught the Corinthians, this is his first letter to them, which means he had taught them orally before he ever wrote this epistle. And all those things he taught orally, he wanted them to remember, you see, because this is the first time he wrote to them. Then the second... Corinthian epistle, he says more or less the same thing again, to abide by these traditions, and now we have him referring to both the first letter and the oral traditions that he gave them. He said not, nothing was ever to be tucked away as if it never occurred, whether it was oral or written in Paul's mind. Uh, you also have uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, which is probably the, the most succinct and strongest verse to support tradition, where Paul says that he wants the Thessalonians to keep whatever he has spoken orally and whatever he has written down by letter, you see. Now what Paul does in one breath is he equates or he puts on the same level oral teaching with a written word, okay? So in his mind, there's really no difference. Uh, Paul often speaks about the oral word that he got from God mm -hmm. uh, as something that was given to him directly from God just like scripture was given directly from God. So to him, there's no difference. And he wants the Thessalonians <laughs> to hold on to that oral tradition. He's not implying that once you have the oral tradition and then I'm, I'm gone, let's say Paul dies, right. that they're just to ignore that oral tradition anymore. He's telling them exactly the opposite, to hold on to that oral tradition. And that's what the Catholic Church has done for all these centuries. Okay. Uh, specifically in the, in the uh, Catholic uh, doctrine, what's the difference between formal and material sufficiency of scripture. All right, well here we're getting into a technical area. <clears throat> um, formal sufficiency would be more or less a Protestant view, which is that unless it's explicitly taught in scripture, then you're not to believe it. Uh, material sufficiency would hold that you can have something um, briefly touched upon in scripture or maybe a cursory reference to it or something of that sort. Uh, and that view then develops into the view that everything the Catholic Church believes is either implicitly or explicitly taught in Scripture somewhere. Now, let's say, you know, we talk about the Immaculate Conception of Mary. A lot of times the Catholic Church will be accused of uh, having a doctrine that's not in the Bible. Right, or but, adding things to the Bible. Yeah. Now, from the material sufficiency view, we would say that that view of the Immaculate Conception is implicit in certain verses. It may not be explicit, but it's there implicitly, and that's what we call the material of the sufficiency of Scripture, okay. you see. Whereas so the Protestant would say, well, no, it has to be formal. That means there has to be an explicit statement there. Now, the reason the Catholics can say that is because they have a whole tradition alongside of this implicit verse of Scripture that tells them the meaning of this implicit verse of Scripture as it was recorded down through the history of the Church. Okay. So if you're a Catholic, you can believe in the material sufficiency of Scripture. Yes. Uh, the Church has not come out with a dogmatic statement that that is their view right. of Scripture, but that certainly is a working view that they have within the Church now. Okay. Um, 
Doesn't 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 pr prove the, su the formal sufficiency of Scripture? I think we have it right here. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Yeah, Paul's writing to Timothy here, and uh, Paul's just about to die, and uh, Timothy has to take over. And so he's trying to teach Timothy what to do, and he gives him this encouragement here. He says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, what happens with this verse is, uh, if a Protestant is looking for one verse of Scripture that's going to try to support his view of sola scriptura, that is, that the Bible alone is the authority, right. this is the verse he's going to go to. Because on the surface, it seems very strong. Uh, yeah, it says that the Scripture is going to make you, um, it's going to instruct you in all righteousness. I think even some uh, um, um, times you'll see it's the word perfect in there. That's right. That's right. Uh, and sometimes what they'll do is they'll confuse the word inspiration with sufficiency. They'll say, well, because the Scripture is inspired, that means it's sufficient to do these things. Now, we have no argument with that. The Scripture is inspired, and it's good, and it's wholesome, and it will do a lot of good things. But the key word here is profitable. Okay? Uh, that's a, 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 a rather weak word if you look at it actually in the Greek language. It's the Greek word aphalimos, okay. which means something is, uh, it's okay, it's useful, it is good, but it's not the only thing, you see. If Paul were trying to teach a doctrine of sola scriptura, he would have put a much stronger word there. He would say, Scripture is given by inspiration and is the only source for doctrine. You see, he doesn't. He just says it's profitable. And that implies that within Paul's teaching, there is other sources that are just as good to give this man what he needs to be equipped for every good work. And right in the same context, in 2 Timothy 2.21, Paul uses this exact phrase, prepared for every good work. And he's talking about Timothy's conduct. He says, if you are a good person, the way God wants you to be, that's going to equip you to do every good work, you see? So Paul already in the context has another source that he's using to accomplish the same thing 2 Timothy 3.17 is trying to accomplish, which means the scripture is not the only source, you see? Then as you go on in that same context, you'll see that Paul points out his own teaching, his own lifestyle, the mother and grandmother of Timothy, Eunice and Lois, as other sources that Timothy can go to to accomplish the same objective. Other things that are profitable. Exactly, you see. So the, if you look at the whole context, uh, Paul is not teaching a sola scriptura. If anything, he's teaching that all these things help Timothy. And even, even still, if we go back two verses, we'll see that Paul mentions that he was talking about scriptures that they learned from their youth. That's right, uh, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in christ jesus now this is interesting because uh timothy is portrayed here as a child and yet he knows the scriptures as a child and these scriptures are the things that tell him about salvation jesus christ but the only scriptures he had were the old testament scriptures it couldn't have been the new testament that's right because it wasn't written especially when timothy was a child right okay so how is he going to extract from the old testament the salvation about jesus christ without somebody teaching him you see, and that's where his mother and grandmother came in that were talked about uh, verses prior to this. And they are the sources that Paul is again referring to to help him understand the scriptures. And that's exactly what Catholic theology teaches. The scriptures are great, but you don't know what they say until somebody teaches you what they say. And the only, re and the only reason that person knows what they say is because somebody told them before what they say. Right. You see, and that's passed down through the centuries. I think there was an example used that if you use the analogy that um, the Bible equips us for all good works that um, uh, you could use any type of example if you go to a bike store and uh, uh, you're equipped with a bike and they give you a bike and a helmet and knee pads and so you're equipped for every good work but um, you may not know how to ride a bike right so uh, there's got to be more than just the equipment that goes along with it sure good that's a, one of the best analogies I've ever heard I didn't make it up. <laughs> well, I wish it was mine, but you it wasn't. Stole it for somebody else. I know. <laughs> it's word for word. It's all right. Okay. You got 15 minutes of fame. Okay. <laughs> um, question seven: If holy tradition and the written word of God do not contradict one another, then you should be able to make a biblical case for the Catholic position. Can you? First, prove the apostles' oral teaching was inspired in the Bible. Yeah, uh, well, that we go back to that verse that we had before, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, which uh, 
is the verse that Paul puts on the same level, our old teaching and the mm -hmm. written word. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then there's um, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, and I don't know if you had a copy of that one down yes, here or I not. Yes, I do. But that one... Uh, I think that's two from here. So I okay. a little switching <clears throat> here. Oh, we've already talked about 2.15. Yes, that's the one I just mentioned. Okay. This is the one. Uh, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the Word of God, there it is, the Word of God, which you heard from us, okay, oral teaching, you welcomed, it, you welcomed it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God. Okay, so he's contrasting Word of men with Word of God, so you know it's coming directly as a revelation from God, which also effectively works in you who believe, all right? So he's saying, what I taught to you orally, is just as much the Word of God as what I've wrote down. As a matter of fact, a lot of times, Paul didn't even write his epistles. Somebody else wrote his epistles, and he orally dictated to them. Such as maybe Acts? Uh, no, Acts was written by Luke. Okay. But um, Colossians was written by somebody else. Uh, Paul's scribe, his name was Tertius. Oh, really? I didn't so, know that. Yeah, his, his scribe is writing down all these things in the letter, you know, which becomes the scripture eventually, and Paul's dictating this orally.